Um, how many books have you put out? Because this is, I don't know, what is this, like the 10th or something? Yeah, it's around there. Um, I have like maybe eight or nine real legit books, and then I have um, some books that was just a compendium or a compilation of my best blog posts. Mm. I don't consider those books. There's three of those out there. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, we're coming up on 10. Yeah. If not 10, it's nine or eight. Yeah. Cool. So, um, what was the motivation behind the book of numbers? Uh, it was economics and, uh, <clears throat> I know you honorarily gave me my PhD in economics. I appreciate that from Ryerson university. You're welcome. Uh, but yeah, the main thing was economics where, um, if you look at it, uh, the vast majority of current and historical economic production and innovation and creation was by men. And I had a very simple question like, well, if we take away the number one thing that incentivizes men to work, which would be pretty attractive women, mm. what would be the economic ramifications? And furthermore, and more specifically on the individual level is uh, men spend the majority of their time, energy, and resources. It's the ultimate economic question. They pursue it chasing women. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I said, okay, given today, uh, the environment and women's interest in marriage or children and all that other stuff, not to mention some uh, statistics about you know how successful the average man can expect to be, is men essentially spending their entire lives worth the pursuit of women? Like, mm -hmm. you know, is this, is this, so I, I did the, first cost benefit analysis on the pursuit of women. And that's, that's what I wanted to do. And the ramifications are huge. And, uh, you know, everyone's like kind of tongue in cheeky, like, Oh, look, he did a ROI on women. How cute is that? I'm like, no, nah, there's, there's some larger global. I do mean global economic consequences that if frankly, women are fat, uh, mean, disagreeable, uh, you are tanking, you're, you're pouring like sugar or salt into the, the the gas tank of the economic engine of the world and men are just not going to produce as much as they would have had they been guaranteed through societal norms and convention you know, a wife and children mm -hmm. and so um that that was the larger economic and, and right now as, as i think everybody knows it's kind of a an interesting wow how edgy and i like no there's some there's some consequences where if all of a sudden you know, what accounted for 90% of real GDP, and I will say this, I'll, I'll state this, nearly 100% of all technological innovation, men, what happens if they shut down? You know, if they have no incentive and they they decide to like, yeah, I'll just stay at home or I'll be a neat or something like that. So that is what, that's what uh, prompted me to write this book is it's an economic analysis that it's also a, a question I pose to men like, hey, is this worth your time? Mm-hmm. Long story short, it really isn't, though. <laughs> yeah, yes. If we, we don't have to read through it. Right. Yeah, there we go. And good well, night, everybody. Good well, night. Yeah, I mean, like, I think we already have the answer to this. I mean, it's 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 not the best use of a man's time to, to, to throw a lot of time, effort, money, and resources. But the book itself breaks down why and the underlying notion behind that. It's like the foundation of all of that so you can get the mechanics of it. I think men, generally speaking, are more rational, deductive, logical problem solvers. So the book of numbers deals with all the elements that lead up to, it's really not a good use of your time if you throw a lot of time, effort, and resources at this, right? Right, and I, I think everybody knows. I mean, we kind of like, ha, 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 it's negative, and everyone says, what's the ROI? Is it even positive? And, and so I think we all understand that. But also what I wanted to achieve with this book was doing a, a breakdown of the statistical analyses and like, look, here are some hard numbers. And some of them are within an error of range. I'm not saying these are like, you know, precise. To, it's a social science. So it, there, there's always room for error. But I think uh, two things, one, to give men, both old and young, like some numbers like, look, if you're going to go and gamble in this house, here are your statistics. Here are your odds. And the other thing uh, for guys like you, me, you know, old timers, Terrence Pop, who've gone through hell to look at it and say, is, this, is there something wrong with me? Did I do something wrong? And I'd like to, you know, put this out there, that book saying, no, it ain't there. Unless you're like a jerk or there's something wrong with you, actually generally wrong with you. But for most men, no, it's not your fault. And so it's to deliver a bit of sanity uh, to men out there who have gone through hell who have, have gone through the, you know, 
trials and tribulations of dating Western women in general mm -hmm. uh, to say like, look, no, it, it, the, the numbers are on your side and it doesn't solve the problem. I mean, June cleavers are not going to be mass produced anytime soon, but at least, you know, it wasn't your fault. And so uh, there's an element of forgiveness that I like uh, to, to promote that book with. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, you went through my book and I, and I collected some data on, um, the success rates of long-term relationships and marriages. And one of the things I, I came across in a study uh, was, I think it was something like 3% of couples after eight years are living in a state of like bliss or obsession right. for one another. And I believe that the uh, data was something like 12 or 13%, something like about 12 and a half percent um, were still living in a state of love for one another. The rest right. of them weren't. Right. It's, 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 it's just not like that old fairy tale that you think that you're going to sign up for when you're watching Disney and Gilligan's Island when they're all fawning over the girls and all that stuff. It's that's not the reality of the world and the way that things usually pan out. I mean, you can have a good experience, but you need all of these things to fall in place to make that happen. The way that you wrote the book, though, I noticed that when you kind of put it together, you were talking about this from the perspective of the average Joe. Why did you? Why did you bring it down to the average Joe level? Like, why did it have to be like the average guy? Because because of uh, applicability. Um, I know you, me, other people that tune in were probably on the right side of the bill distribution curve. But uh, I wanted to be applicable to your average American Western male. Uh, the other what does problem, that avatar look like? Is that like a guy that works a nine to five job? Um, yeah. You Ryan know. Stone, you know, Ryan Stone. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay like a Ryan Stone kind of guy. All right. <laughs> no, no, Ryan. I'm I'm just busting his balls. No, you're and and it's to be uh you bring up a good point because no, the average guy is not us. Not to not to swing my dick around, but frankly, no, the average guy is not me, it's not you. This is to be the average guy, so it'd be very applicable. The other problem that I ran into, Richard, was like to run scenarios and run statistics, I had to say like, okay, we need a, a, a subject. We need a, a, a test subject. And so I'm going to run with average Joe five. And so all the, not all, but, but a lot of the statistical analyses were done. Like, okay, here's this guy. He's an average looking guy, average income. What does the average man look to get? Now, interestingly enough, I do have the model. I could tweak it. Like, okay, let's say you're a nine. Or let's say you have this type of income. Uh, I haven't programmed height into it because, frankly, it's intangible to to program into it. Uh, but that that was the reason why I focused on the average. Another example is a lot of people would say I define success as happily married. Well, a lot of guys don't want to get married, but that has been the traditional uh, metric by which we would consider success. So there were in order to do some analyses and crunch some real numbers. I had to make some assumptions that would not apply to everyone, uh, but it was the average guy looking to get married and be happily married till death do him part. And I know that's idealistic and it's not the entire case, but I thought that would be the most applicable and universal and relatable uh, when I did that analysis. Mm.